Well, as I was driving here, by a show of hands, did anybody happen to listen to me on the radio years ago? Okay. So I was on the radio for a couple of years, and outside of my mother, I don't think anybody listened to me. But this is the first time that I've been out doing a by design seminar in about six years. So um, I don't get nervous, but I was excited. And uh, so what I'm going to do is when I start, I start. And we're going to run for about 60 straight minutes. So what I want to do is just get the groundwork laid out as to what's about to happen. I find that the study of theology, Christian apologetics, and my field of expertise, which is healthcare, run in parallel. Let me explain to you what that means. Every spring, I send my wife and my five children out of the house, and I clean my garage. I take everything out of my garage, I clean it right down to the baseboard, and I put everything back neatly. So when I speak, we're going to take everything that we know about healthcare, and we're going to bang it out of this ear because we're gonna start with a nice clean slate. Because today we're gonna to be speaking about the incidence of chronic disease, the incidence and what inflammation means, and what byproducts like obesity are costing our country. No, I'm not gonna give you the top 10 things to lose weight. I'm not that kind of teacher. Then we're gonna send, put our head to this side, and so you have the understanding of why I wrote by design. By design, was it necessarily for believers? By design was my effort to walk into the world and speak to atheists. And a lot of it was stemmed from this book by Dawkins called The God Delusion. If you want to know why our universities are the way they are, it started with this number one best-selling book. There is no God, and as Mr. Dawkins and his friend Hawkins would say, if someone believes in God, no longer debate them, 2002. Mock them. Wow. Now, I am here as a gentle believer in 1 Peter 3.15 to give a testimony in my own way. And what that means is I love speaking to people like Hawkins and Dawkins. So this Saturday, head, we're going to bang out everything we know about theology because most people I come in contact with really don't have a firm understanding of health, or is there a God? Not who is God. Is there a God? The most fundamental question that everybody in the room has stared at themselves in the mirror and at some point has asked themselves, is there a God? So that's my groundwork. We're going to clean out the garage. We're going to start from scratch. And whether you're a believer, a semi-believer, an atheist, an agnostic, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Jew, does not matter to me. We're all human beings, we're born naked, we die naked. And in between that journey, is there a God and how do we take care of ourselves? So you're gonna test me, because if you can't explain something simple, you're not necessarily a good communicator, so you're gonna test me. If you have to understand something, we have to be able to communicate it in a way that it's understood. So let's start with some pictures. Because I feel as though we all have a basic understanding. And by the way, I never insult my audiences. For 30 years of doing this, you guys are doing everything great, but the people on 537 are a mess. <laughs> and we're going to talk about the people on 537. Guy goes to a funeral and he's late. He's the bagpipe player. And he can't find a funeral, so he's going through the bushes, he finally sees the guys. There's no one there except the guys digging a hole. Gets there, they're eating lunch, they're sitting on the truck. He goes over to the hole, doesn't say nothing. Pulls out his bagpipe, pays, plays the most beautiful rendition of Amazing Grace he's ever played. The guys come over, they stand around the hole, nobody says anything to each other. He starts crying, they start crying. He ends. They go over to their truck, they grab their shovels. They're gonna start going back to work. He packs up his bagpipe and he's walking over to his truck and he hears one guy say to the other, that was the most moving thing I've ever seen in my life and I've been installing septic systems for 30 years. <laughs> Those people on 537, God bless them with the scales. They don't know what health is and many of them don't know is there a God. So, 
Remember my bagpipe player. We're banging in the rocks out there. We don't know where we are. And so we have to ask ourselves some questions. Why are Americans lost like the guy playing the bagpipe? Why does healthcare make up 20% of the GDP? And why is it going to 33% in the next 10 years? There are studies that show it's not going to be Al Qaeda. It's not going to be Russia. The United States will fold upon itself economically due to the cost of health care. Why are we sicker than ever? Why do insurance costs keep going up and we keep, playing, we keep blaming God for most of this? And why did the New England Journal of Medicine publish a report indicating that if your children, my, four, my five children, were born after the year 2000 or so, if your children were born after the year 2000, they will have a shorter life expectancy of their parents. First time in Western civilization history that children will have a shorter life expectancy of their parents. And we have to ask why, why, why? I tell my children, most important question you could ask is why? Why is my car insurance based upon my own ability to navigate a car, right? If I go out and rear-end four people in the next six months, everybody will say, pretty, and your car insurance should be more than mine, right? Not healthcare. We're all in this together. It's one gigantic pool. So if I'm going to the doctor twice a year, keeping myself healthy and fit, and Bob up the streets down in two six-packs and eating cheeseburgers, he's got the same cost of healthcare to my do. Not so fair, is it, sometimes? So I want everybody to feel like this. God gave us this miracle of a body. No need to treat it poorly because we could thrive. So my audiences and my patients, this is what I think about. Adele Davis, one of my favorite nutritionists, said, as I see it, every day you do one of two things. You wake up and you either build health or produce disease. Let's make a choice. We have free will, right? I hear pastors. I love my pastors. Free will, free will. Free will also means choice. Pastor Kevin. <laughs> Bad news, like I said, for the first time in a thousand years, generations are likely to die younger than in the parents. The present Medicare financial overhang is $37 trillion, nearly three times the current national debt. As you can see, this is a very old slide because our current <laughs> national debt is a little bigger than that. We don't even have the money to pay for what o Medicare doesn't pay. And more than 70% of these healthcare costs, follow me, there's the C word, or for the treatment of largely preventable, say the word, chronic, that's the C word, disease. So our pharmaceutical approach of managing chronic illness, as much as it's made a lot of people a lot of money, has been success, not successful in treating the rising burden of type 2 diabetes, dementia, autoimmune, and cancers, but like Twain said, Truth is like poetry, and nobody likes poetry, right? <laughs> so truth is truth, numbers are numbers. I've, re I've been doing this for 30 years, in and out of corporate America, CFOs, HR directors, teaching them how to contain healthcare costs. I quit. I stopped doing meetings, I stopped doing it. Nobody listens, nobody cares. We have to do this on a local, person to person, family to family, municipality to municipality level. I came out of school 30 years ago and I was gonna take down Coke and Pepsi. I don't wanna take down Coke and Pepsi. I just want a handful of people maybe make changes in their lives. Because God gave us the ability to do that and yet, don't worry God, you know I got it. You know that, you know, we've been there, right? I got it God. 200 years of industrialized farming. We created hydrogenated corn oil for my friend Bob that we hear about later. Then he, made, uh, then he made high fructose corn syrup in the 70s. Created a lot of GMOs. Sitting is the new smoking. You know, don't forget those dirty farmers. They move around, they wake up at five o'clock and they use their bodies, right? But we put everybody behind a desk and gave them a mouse. Remember ladies, you could have it all? Remember that? Oh yeah, you could have it all. Now you got as much cancer and heart disease as men do. You could have it all. Let's go running on treadmills, because that's how we're going to lose weight. Stupidest invention, every one of them belongs in a river. Glamour Magazine taught our young girls what to look like, sizes and negative twos. I am not a scale or mirror guy. I could care less what you weigh or what you look like in a mirror. I'm actually considered obese by my insurance carrier. 
The problem is they put me on a scale to weigh gross weight. Muscle weighs more than fat. <laughs> birth control pills, we've whacked out all of our young women on birth control pills. I'll get to the impact of that later. Let's work because we're equal like a man. Are you supposed to be tired all the time? Forget breastfeeding, that's dirty. We wouldn't want to take the most magnificent food God ever created and give it to a baby. Let's give them corn. Let's make corn. Let's take a lot of corn and feed it to our children, which is highly inflammatory. My father would say to me, I'd say, Dad, I have 103 fever. Go outside and play. Dad, I have tuberculosis. Go outside and play. Dad, I have a broken arm. Go outside and play. Did anybody grow up like me? I mean, it was, it was just go outside and play was the end. To everything. My mother would say, go walk Hyler Street. That was in Hacksack. That means go get a job. <laughs> Everything's by design. And if you want to make God laugh, make a plan. So let's see what this word chronic means. Ongoing illness and conditions over and over and over. Highly preventable through diet and exercise. Early detection is key. Leading cause of death and disability in the United States. Chronic illness, the leading cause of death and disability in the United States. And here we are, accounts for 81% of all of our hospital stays, 91% of our prescriptions, and 70% of our two-thirds of every doctor's visit is tied to a chronic, most of the time, man-made illness. Now, these expenditures, our, my medical friends, including myself, we go to school, we treat acute illness, and thank God we go to school to treat acute illness. Fall off a ladder, break your arm, have a heart attack, have a stroke, you betcha, we're best in the world in emergency medicine. We're 37th in the world in healthcare. So, what are we using our healthcare system for? We took a system that was designed for acute care and we packed it with chronic illness. Most doctors don't know how to treat chronic illness, so it's a pill for every ill, and you move on with your life. The cost that we're all paying for, guys, is right there. 47 trillion by 2030, and there are your diseases. Arthritis, everything that ends in ITIS means what? Inflammation. Inflammation, very good. So we did the C word, and now we're gonna go into the I word eventually, because every word, it ends in ITS, neuritis, arthritis, colitis. You could play the game with me. You probably have some of these words as the people on 537 have told you about their conditions. Alcohol, diabetes, smoking, and heart disease. 33% of adult, uh, adults are obese. That's moving towards 50% in the next 10 years. 20% of our children are not going outside and playing. And that's going up to one third of our children are obese. Diabetes is the leading cause of a whole bunch of bad stuff. Why does it cost co so much? 55 to 70% of all claims are associated with behavior, choice, and lifestyle. This is a, uh, something I was quoted on in a magazine years ago. It was a uh, magazine for a big business. Focusing on behavior is the most effective way to develop long-term cost containment without jeopardizing benefits. Over 50% of Americans don't meet these recommendations for aerobic exercise. All right, so we know all this stuff. Or let's talk quickly about cancer. Let's tie now, test me, make sure I'm explaining this clearly, and let's go to the biggest study on cancer ever conducted, which taught us the last bullet point. Environment has the principal cause role in causing sporadic cancer. Environment. Environment, that's how we live our lives. That means the food we put in a hole under our nose and the way we choose to use our brain and the way we choose to use this miracle thing called the human body. What does it mean? Second bullet point, indication that more than 50% of cancers have a nutritional component. Harvard doesn't even teach nutrition in the med school. 70% of other med schools, don't blame them. I love my medical doctors. They go to school for acute illness. You wouldn't hire an electrician to do plumbing work. So when patients come in all the time, my doctor didn't listen to me. He, does, he didn't read my blood test like you read. He's not trained to do it. So let's just say it as it is. Let's be frank about the fact that we've got 50% of cancers, one third of Americans are dying from cancer, 50% of Americans are dying from heart disease. Two conditions are killing over 80% of us. Now, let's learn some more. So many people spend their health 
gaining wealth, and they try to spend their wealth to regain their health. I just like that one. When I was a pre-med student, I stumbled into a public health class, and I decided to get a degree in public health. I decided to get a degree in nutrition. I got a bunch of degrees. I spent five years in undergrad school. That's another story. But I love this definition. Health is not the scale and the mirror. Health is a complete state of physical, social, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. Now, by the way, they removed the word spiritual 10 years ago. I keep my slide. And not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Pretty, and what's the first symptom that shows up in heart disease in men? 50% of men, what's their first symptom of heart disease? Death. They're dead by the time they hit the floor. We're going to use pain as a criteria for health. What's the last symptom to show up in cancer? Pain. Does a little bell go off when cell division happens in an aberrant way? No. So we have to be aware of how to prevent illness and that it happens. And we could do it through our behavior. And every day I see people, victims of their own behavior. I'm sorry, this screen does not like my pointer. So victims of their own behavior, they have chronic illness or often in pain and take multiple medications. Let's take control of it. We have free will, we have choice. It requires work. Every day, each one of us can change our behavior right now. We can't change our past, but we can change what we're doing for the rest of the day and into tomorrow. My next picture. Now, for this one, I have to use St. Peter and the gates of heaven. Do not email me. Please do not send me an email, Christians. They have to. That was supposed to be a joke. Sometimes I get these emails from Christians. Oh, you said, okay, I'm going to use St. Peter in a joke. Guy goes to heaven. St. Peter's at the gate. Guy goes, St. Peter goes, uh, computer's broken. We don't have any information about you. You have to tell me a little bit about your life. Guy starts sweating. He goes, what do you mean the computer's broken? So he goes, well, I'm driving down the street, and I saw these bikers. They were, they were messing with this woman. So I grabbed the tire iron out of the truck, and I went up to the lead biker, big guy, nose earring, tattoos. And I said, listen, you got to stop messing with the lady. You're going to have to deal with me. So St. Peter goes, wow, it's an amazing story. When did this happen? He goes, two minutes ago. <laughs> we don't know, right? I'm not here to tell you you can live forever. I'm here to tell you that if one of your ladies is being harassed by a group of bikers, I'm going to pull over and try to help. You guys are on your own. But we don't know when the last day is going to be. We don't know tragedy and trauma. We've all lived long enough. We've lived through it. And I don't want to come across as a teacher who's just going to pump you up. That's not my agenda. My agenda is making behavioral choices, understanding that the biker is out there. We never know when that might happen. Knowing we're still banging in the rocks. They are on 537 through my bagpipe player. But this illustration is about we cannot control the plan. Right, everybody? Go like this. Make me feel good. OK, make, make me feel good. Now, why do I choose to try to live a 100-year lifestyle knowing that the biker is out there? It's because of them. And everybody has their own picture, right? That's me and my wife and my five children. I've never met a patient in 30 years going knee to knee. 300,000 visits I've been blessed with. Who said, pretty and I don't want to feel better. What do you mean function better? I don't want to be able to walk up and down stairs or play with my grandchildren on the front lawn. And I really like just to be able to touch my knees. What do you mean touch my toes? <laughs> and I don't want to live quality years. I want to be on five to 10 medications. I want to park my butt on a couch at the age of 65 when I retire. Nobody says that. We're human. We want to feel good. We want to function well. And we want to live quality disease for years. I've never met a person who wanted to do something different. God designed us that way. He designed us to feel that way. So pick your own picture. <clears throat> Choose the picture that maybe 100 years makes sense for you to live. I'm 57. I'd like to live 100 years. Now, my grandmother died, great-grandmother died at the age of 100 in her bed. I never met her, but I love that story as a little kid. That's why I chose that. Now, it doesn't mean that the biker's not out there and it might affect me, but how am I going to do it? Prudy, and how does this get done? I published this years ago. Physical, the food, the stuff we put in a hole under our nose. The psychological, the stuff that goes between that three pound piece of fat between your ears. Somebody calls you a fathead, it's a compliment. <laughs> the brain is 80% fat. And 
the physical, what we're doing with this amazing machine. So, you could choose better parents. <laughs> yeah, good luck genetically, right? And if everybody plays the genetic game, right? We all have done that. I wish this was bigger, I wish this was smaller. You stare at yourself in the mirror. I wish this had hair on it, I wish this didn't have hair on it. Ah! <laughs> you can't play the genetic game, right? Mommy and Daddy Prudy got together in 65 and had some fun. I would have liked to have been six foot two, but guess what, it didn't work out for me. <laughs> so we can't control the things we can't control, but what we can control is our behavior, our environment, and our lifestyle. Those are the things we can control. And the things that we can control to make better choices every day is our environment, sleep and rest, emotional, fitness, posture, fuel. Well, let's see, let's, let's talk about the people on 537. Top 10 things that the people on 537, the men eat. Hamburgers, french fries, pizza, breakfast sandwich, side salad, eggs, donuts. You know what a donut is? You guys would never feed a child a donut, I know that. <laughs> but the people on 537, that what they do, let's say we're going to start a donut shop. You got to get a vat of bubbling cancer. And you get a really, really hot hydrogenated oil. You get a really, really hot. Then you take white flour that has no nutritional value. It was invented in the lab in 1914. They stripped all the color out of it, and we made Wonder Bread. I wonder what's in it. And then what happens is we stick it in the bubbling vat of cancer. We sprinkle table sugar on it. In 1935, we used to consume 35 pounds of sugar per person per year. We currently consume 150 pounds of sugar per person per year. Is that God's fault? Now, I don't consume 150 pounds of sugar a year, but I think Bob's consuming 250. Sugar is the leading cause of obesity. Let me repeat that. Sugar is the leading cause of obesity. Remember COI, chronicity, inflammation, and obesity. Obesity, primary cause is not fat. Bad fats are very bad for us, but it's sugar. So let's keep going now that you know what a donut is, and I'm sure You'll instruct the people on 537 not to eat those. Hash brown, Chinese food. Chinese people don't eat our Chinese food, it's so bad. <laughs> Main salad. Women, french fries, hamburger, pizza, side salad, chicken nuggets, breakfast sandwich, main salad. There's nothing but starch and sugar. Starch and sugar, it fills up the belly and it created the $47 trillion tsunami that we're all paying for. So my daughter, who is now about to turn 23. When she was younger, she was a very good softball player. I took her to buy a softball bat. There were two bats. One was $250 and the other one was $50. I'm not cheap, but I bought her a $50 bat and I took $200 for lessons so she learned how to swing it. We're spending a lot of money out there, folks, on stuff, books, exercise stuff. It frankly doesn't work because we never learned how to swing it. So this is an illustration also of learning how to swing so that we become aware. Now, I was a pre-med student in 1985. I remember seeing this, Matt. There was hardly any data on obesity. So let's switch subjects and see what we're doing. Now, by the 1990s, we realized that about 10 to 14% of our population was obese. Now, what I'm going to show you, folks, is a pandemic. It's a slow pandemic. It's not the kind of pandemic that we, were just, we just went through. This is something called epidemiology. It is the study of disease. So in 1990, about 14%, 10 to 14%, we then jumped in five years to about 15 to 19%. Now I was up and down Route 17, Route 4, all over the state, Borders bookstores, Barnes and Noble bookstores in the 90s with my little index cards teaching this stuff. Nobody listened to me. Well, a few people listened. So by 2020, we were greater than 20% obesity, okay? 2005, we start introducing this dark red color, which is 33% of these states are clinically obese. We start seeing chronic illness go to height we never saw before. The costs of chronic illness after 2005, because by 2010, we all knew in my industry that the whole map was going to be 33% obese. And what happened was the CDC changed their colors. They didn't, they, they, they didn't like the colors. They, they changed the colors on me. So I called up and I complained. And you know how that went. So 
Our childhood obesity, you remember go outside and play? That was me, 5%. 5% obesity in the 70s to the 80s. Then boom, in the 90s, we jumped to 10 to 12%. Then boom, in the 2000s, 20%, 20%. I run a program called Trim Kids, and it's a program that I do as a nutritionist, school psychology, and a PhD in exercise physiology. Three powerhouse, very experienced, very high level degree people go into school systems for free and do pediatric obesity workshops. Nobody comes. I sit there with my team and no one comes. 90, uh, 925 million people suffer from hunger, 1.5 billion are now overweight. First time in American or in, a, in a global history that more people are obese. Here are the myths, guys. This is why nobody loses weight. This is the inside scoop as to why no one loses weight, okay? Calories in, calories out, high fat diets, low carbohydrates diets, high protein diets, point counting, whatever that is, extreme diet. I don't even know what any of this garbage is, but none of it basically works. Because you see, what somebody in the field of weight loss actually knows if they actually went to school and they actually studied biochemistry, physiology, pathophysiology, histology, and all those biology words that nobody likes to take in school, is that gut dysbiosis, interstitial intestinal edema, leukocytosis, GMO foods, artificial additives, excessive medication, autoimmune suppressive, issues with absorption, digestion, utilization, insulin resistance, lack of... Now, is anybody going through this list when you go to your doctor's office? Are they looking at these things? Or are they saying, eat patio, or eat keto? What week, is, what week are we on? What week are we in now? Who's gonna release another book for me to take apart? How about leptin resistance? Anybody talking about that? Enzyme imbalances. How about re reduced activity of sodium and potassium pump? Do you know what the sodium potassium pump is? Do you know how to measure it? How about parasites and needs, Cushing syndromes, hormonal imbalances, neurological disbalances, co consumption of drugs and steroids? This is what actually causes obesity, but how many people are taking it apart? Well, let me give you another behind the curtain. Nobody makes any money taking this apart because the insurance companies don't pay us to do this. How about that? If I put this in my notes that I did this, nobody pays you. You have to pay for this because they don't want you to know this stuff. They'd rather just give you a book and send you home and call it a day and a pill for every ill. The inside, I'm giving you behind the curtains here, guys, because you see, I'm in love, with, in love with what God created. The human body is what I've studied. Don't have me come over your house and do your electrical work. I can't fix nothing, but I could do this. This is what I was called to do. I love anatomy, physiology, biochemistry. I love taking it apart because this miracle can do this. This miracle could do this. I do not recommend it. This miracle could do this. This body of ours can do this. My wife and I stopped at five. They beat us. This miracle can do this. Anybody watch this guy run? Was I the only one laying on the couch going, oh my gosh, he's running 100 meters and there's nobody else in the screen. He was so fast. Are you amazed at the miracle of the human design? This human that we get to carry around with us for 100 years, if you don't wake up every day and say, thank you, God, I am an eating, thinking, mechanical machine. <coughs> it is beautiful at all stages of life, but most of us, right, we're here. Right, we're here, we're walking around Monmouth County, we're loving our wives, husbands, children, grandparents enjoying a life, let's turn it around. So that here's one of my patients, I know you can't see all this, the, this is the medications that he's taking. This are all of the conditions and surgeries that has, he's 65 years old by the way. It's no joke. So what do we do? Recondition, commit yourself to reconditioning. Physical, nutritional, psychological, the biker we can't stop. Let's forget about 537 and my bagpipe player. Let's get in tune with understanding as opposed to not understanding. And let's do this by understanding our behavior, that truth matters. Don't worry about the things we can't control, the bike or chronic illness, ask why, ask why. And 100 year lifestyle, let's continue to learn and let's talk about the differences, yes, between, say it with me, 
I can't believe I'm at this point in my career. Men and women. All right. I'm a lot of fun in corporate America. So this guy's walking along to California Beach. God, in his glory, says to him, you've been a great steward of mine. I want to bless you with anything you want. He goes, well, God, I love Hawaii. Can you build me a bridge to Hawaii? God goes, really? How self-serving. Think about all the manpower, all of the natural resources needed to build your bridge. You sure you want that? Think again. Guy goes, God, I'm so sorry you're right. He goes, God, I want to know what it means when my wife gives me the silent treatment. What does it mean when she just begins to cry for no reason? Lord, how do I make a woman truly happy? God goes, you want two or four lanes on that bridge. <laughs> we are very, 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 very different people. Now, these are my, these are my love slides. I, don't, I, can, I, I could come back and do, by the way, I, have, I, have, I could stay here for six hours and I could just go. So I'm a very, un anyway, these, yeah, my slides in red come out of my hormone imbalance seminars that I do for men and women. And we talk about love, we talk about sex, sorry mom, we talk about everything, right? So this is what we talk about, the differences between men and women. I took one slide for you. 12 months after retirement, men experience a heart attack. Retirement without love is golf and death. Men must always be solving problems. By the way, this is just about men. Problem solving allow men to face stress and it increases testosterone. Problem solving is what men are designed to do. Follow the design. Men have 30 times more testosterone than women. Testosterone equals problem solving. Men who have hobbies build testosterone. Now the last bullet point is the one I want to open your eyes on because earlier I talked about the difference between men and women and what's going on in our society. Today's men at age 40 have the testosterone of men age 70, 40 years ago. Did God do that? Did God just wake up one day and go, Phoom. Boom, I'm going to lower testosterone on all of these men. Anybody want to gander a guess as to why that happened? What's the opposing hormone to testosterone? Estrogen. estrogen. How would you increase estrogen? See, it's not necessarily a lowering of testosterone. It's the imbalance of testosterone and estrogen. What did you say? Increase xenoestrogens. Increase Zeno Where did they come from? Plastic. Plastics, very good. Give me another one. Food, okay. Anybody else? Lack of exercise. Anybody remember? Lack of exercise, very good. Way back when I talked about these things called birth control pills. Where did birth control pills come out of? The last time I checked, oh yeah, I learned we all urinate. Ah, oh, that's right. Did anybody know that? That we all urinate, men and women? <laughs> Urine has to end up somewhere. And there's this amazing field called nutrition ecology that I love. Nobody ever talks about nutrition ecology. I highly doubt anybody has ever studied it. If you know Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring in the 70s, she knew nutrition ecology. Okay, most people who are my age and above remember that. Now, if we look at the amount of birth control urine that has gone into our ecosystem and has then inhabited our water supply, we have fish in Colorado that have sex characteristics of male and female. You don't even know what the fish is anymore. Did God do that? No. So anyway, I'm sorry I can't spend more time on my pink slides because I love doing my love slides. Love slides are cool. Another day. So let's talk about the difference between men and women through this word stress because most people think, oh, I'm stressed out. I go, really, what happened? I had to stand so long you know, at the line at the Dunkin' Diabetes. It was so long. I mean, it was, it was crazy. You should have seen the line, Prudy. And I said, really? I don't, I don't go there, so I don't know. Um, stress, a forcefully exerted influence of pressure. Your biology, you react to it. You will react to it adversely, mental, physical, emotional. What happens next? Should these reactions should be inadequate or inappropriate to lead to disorders? It stimulates a stress response. That's what stress is. It's good for us. Here's the good stress. I go to the gym. I work out. I stress my muscles. I eat protein. I take the things that are necessary. My body responds in a favorable way. That's good stress. God gave us stress. Stress is very healthy. Stress over a prolonged period of time, uncontrolled, is not healthy. Why, Prudy? And tell me the biology. What happens? Well, let's just go to the bottom. 
By 2020, which is just a couple of years ago, the World Health Organization's depression is the number two cause of lost years of healthy life. That is actually happening right now. And now, don't worry about the slide, it's a cross-section of your brain and a cross-section of something called your adrenal gland. Why did God give us two adrenal glands? They sit on top of our kidneys, they're about the size of walnuts. What do the adrenal glands do? They produce adrenaline, right? So we all know the stories of the gals picking up the burning cars off the children. That's adrenaline. Athletes, you'll see them shake, a sprinter, have a light sweat on them. That's adrenaline. They're getting ready for their race. You ever see a thoroughbred before a race? That's adrenaline. It's cool stuff. Adrenaline is awesome. Now, does adrenaline sound like the God-given hormone I should be using in everyday energy? No way. It's fight flight. So if a lion came in the room, would I say, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to speak to me today. Let's make nice two organized lines and we're gonna walk out the back. There's a lion in the room. We're running through the sheetrock to get away from it, right? That's fight flight. God gave us this reflex. We've all kind of been there in, the life, in our life, right? A temporary wall fell on my daughter Sophia when she was two years old. Hit her right in the head. Did 150 miles an hour to get to the hospital. Cats get her. She was fine. <sighs> Dad, defense mode, fight, flight, ripping through walls to get my daughter to the hospital. Came home, slept 17 straight hours. Anybody been there? Mm -hmm. Right? That's fight, flight. This is what happens when stress comes into the adrenal gland and makes this thing called cortisol. Now, ladies, if I haven't gotten your attention, too much cortisol in your system. I really wish it made your earlobe get really big and you could go to the doctor and they could snip off the earlobe. But what cortisol does is it goes to your belly, your thighs, and your butt. Don't blame me, but that's where it goes. Excessive cortisol is gonna drive adipose tissue to the belly, the thighs, and the butt. Why? Because it's ongoing. You're in fight, flight, fight, flight, flight, fight. You don't get out of it. Little, little trickles every single day, 20, 30 years. You can have it all, baby. Let's go to college and eat bad food. Then I'm going to come out of college and get a job and never sleep. Then I'm going to have babies. I'm going to fit it all in. Women, I'm picking on you, but I'm not because I love you. Your gender has been brutalized. Brutalized by the effect of stress because men who are problem solvers, we're designed to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, work as hard as we can. You ever see a guy come home from work? His testosterone is highest in the morning, lowest night. He can't even think he's five o'clock. What do women do at five o'clock? I want to talk about my day. Okay, great, but you're talking to a zombie. He's dead. He, he's meathead. He's got nothing going on up here. N nothing, like zero. You want to have a love relationship? This goes back to my peak slides. We solve that because you have to time the times in which you talk. Okay, so we'll get, I don't have time for that today. Anyway, physical pains from adrenal fatigue and burnout, chronic fatigue, insomnia, GI problems, we don't poop enough or we poop too much, chronic load resistance, muscle pain, joint pain, cravings for sweet, PMS, headaches, hypoglycemia, emotional, depression, empathy, reduced memory, anxiety, inability, to cope. none of this going on, right? Lack of concentration, fogginess, irritability, none of that going on at the mall. I never meet people like this, right? It's kind of like meeting people who have scales on their eyes. See, that's why I play both games. From a theology perspective, I meet people and I say, 1 Peter 3.15, James, be gentle, love them, give them a message in a caring and gentle way. And then I also say, they just don't know. They're acting irritable because they're filled with stress hormone. And they don't even know they're filled with stress hormone because the best way to test cholesterol is with the saliva. How many of your doctors have run saliva tests on you for cortisol? How many? So sleep disturbance, immune function breakdown, blood sugar dysregulation, gastrointestinal. This is how your body maladapts to chronic stress. Get it checked. A great book by Hanley, PhD, Are You Tired of Being Tired? Mm -hmm. Exceptional book written about adrenal fatigue and burnout. Hate, anger, worry, pessimism, things to avoid, none of that in our society. You ever try watching the news? Everything is anger, hate, worry, pessimism, right? I call my mother, she's happy. <laughs> Poor and adequate sleep, lack of exercise, stimulants, junk food, neglecting relaxation, irregular sleep, wake cycles. This is your brain during REM sleep. This is your brain with high cortisol. You're not healing. There's no healing happening. This is normal bone density with cortisol. You wanna 
cause osteoporosis, which is epidemic. And by the way, you know those slides I showed you on obesity? You could put osteoporosis in there. You could put arthritis in there. You could put type 2 diabetes in there. All the pictures of the maps look like that in the last 25 years. Identify what you can and cannot control. Keep real expectations of yourself. Stop and smell the roses. Talk with your friends. Put the phone down. Right? As Christians, especially as people, fellowship. Fellowship is so rewarding. That's why I don't do telemedicine. You want to meet me? I'll meet you in my office. Be, I'll go knee to knee with you behind my desk. Not behind my desk, but you know what I mean. Over the desk. I want to talk to you. I want to look at you. I want to inspect you. That's what doctoring should be and all about. Understand your priorities, listen to music, laugh, go on vacation, take a break. Regular moderate exercise, strength training, acupuncture could be helpful for, um, for uh, thyroid and for adrenal. Massage, rest, breathing exercises, and of course prayer. Prayer has been linked to everything healthy. Everything healthy. So what do we do? Let's go to our doctor. And we say, doc, he goes up, she goes, you need some thyroid medication. Your thyroid's burnt out. You're a little stressed out, so they give you right, some Synthroid. You go back the next year, the doc goes up. You got some adrenal stress, and it impacted your liver. Your cholesterol's high now. Cholesterol, by the way, is a hormone. It's the most abundant hormone in your body. It's the most important hormone. It's called the master hormone. It makes testosterone. So when you lower cholesterol, you're actually lowering testosterone and your other sex hormones. But that's another story. We'll get into that in another, another session. So now we put you on the Lipitor. So now we got two meds. Now the pancreas wants to get involved. This is a dance. See, I call this like an orchestra. You ever go to an orchestra, a real orchestra, it's amazing to listen to them play. Everybody plays in unison, but then you go to your kid's fourth grade orchestra, <laughs> ee, 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 and you deal with it, but it's like, ah, scratching chalkboard. This is what's happening. We're breaking the orchestra down. Now the pancreas gets involved. We've got to increase, we got to elevate the glucose, so we're going to give you some insulin or metformin. Now the next thing we're going to do is the brain gets really anxious. So let's put you on some Prozac, and you can't sleep, so let's put you on some Lanesta. Then what happens to the testes? They don't work so well. So here you got, ladies. You got, a, you got yourself a 55, 65-year-old guy. He's whacked out on thyroid medication. His elevated cholesterol. He's type 2 diabetic. He's anxious and he can't sleep. But he's got a four-hour erection. And that's the most important thing that we could sell these men. <laughs> and welcome to today's modern medicine. Because I sure want that coming at me at 3 o'clock in the morning. So, now, here we got today's modern medicine and how it relates to hormone, chemical, biochemistry, man-made choices. Stop blaming God. It's not genetic, and that's called our endocrine system. And yeah, you've come a long way. Nutrition. All right. So, my friend Bob, boy, this guy was bored. The Industrial Revolution was really interesting. The Industrial Revolution is only like 150 years. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, we were 10,000 years in the Agricultural Revolution. What is the Agricultural Revolution? You married the girl up the street, you were a farmer, you had 10 kids, five of them lived, and you went about your life. You traded your goods and services, you didn't travel anywhere because there was no transportation, and you ate what came out of the earth. There is, was no such thing as organic or inorganic farming. Everything was organic. Here comes Bob. Bob knows better. A bunch of Bob sat around the table in the early 1900s with the Rockefellers and the J.P. Morgans, and they said, nah, this, this, this farming thing, these, these stupid farmers, what is this? Let's take corn, soy, dairy, beef, chalk, pork, and chicken, sugar, flour. Let's process it. Let's make it. Let's industrialize it. What happened? Well, we got 10 companies that control all of our food. This is the outcome of the industrial food revolution. Now, in 2004, my boys at Time, which I never read, bring apart the secret killer, the surprising link between inflammation. They actually wrote it on the cover of a magazine. I fell off my chair. I f chronic obesity inflammation. Three words politicians will never talk about, ever. Because you have to talk about the food industry. Can't talk about the food industry because they got you elected. Okay, that's another story. Now, the surprising link between inflammation, heart attacks, cancer, and Alzheimer's. And here we got it, folks. 90% of the American 537 food is inflammatory. 
We got grains, those are corn. Corn is a grain, corn is not a vegetable. Refined sugars, omega-6 oils, that's horrible Crisco and such, it's man in the lab by Bob. We got dairy, we got alcohol, and we got grain-fed meat. Last time I drove through a farm, what was a cow eating? Grain. Grass, hay, that is up in my green. That's an anti-inflammatory food. Cows are meant to eat anti-inflammatory foods. But Bob, who makes the corn and the grain, started to feed our cows this inflammatory food. So now we've got 90% of the food budget is spent on inflammatory food. Our oils, which used to come or should come from healthy omega-3s, are anti-inflammatory. I learned in biochemistry class the first day of school, omega-6 oils produce arachnidonic acid and are highly inflammatory. Prudian, how much more omega-3s do we have in our body than omega-6s? Say it. Prudian, how much more, say it, omega-6s do we have in our body than omega-3s? Well, it should be a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one ratio. I get mine measured. When I go to my doctor, simple blood test. You could measure the ratio between omega-3s and omega-6s. I'm sure you know that. But the people on 537 don't know they could get that measured. Wouldn't you love to know how much inflammation you have in your body? It's a simple blood test. Well, Americans have 35 times more omega-6 than omega-3 in their bloodstream. And we want to know why there's chronicity. We want to know why there's obesity and inflammation. 90% of the American food budget is spent on processed food. 25% of all Americans eat at a fast food restaurant. The result, mostly grain sugars, omega-6 fatty acids, trans fats, high fat meat. We're substantially deficient in fruits and vegetables. We're prone to a whole bunch of itises. What does itis mean? Now, if I had a swollen ankle and I jumped up on the chair and I jumped on my swollen ankle five times in a row, everybody should say, that guy's an idiot, we're going home, right? <laughs> but for whatever reason, I could have colitis, neuritis, arthritis, and eat 90% of a diet that's inflammatory and then come to my office and say, everything hurts. <laughs> you know how many people I've treated by never touching them? Just changing their diet? And I almost sound like an idiot because I tell them to eat more natural foods made by God before the Industrial Revolution. So what we have is an inflamed, swollen-looking, overweight population prone to a lot of itises. What do you think this is? A lot of stuff in a blender. Let's make ourselves a fast food strawberry milkshake. So my mother, she used to put about five things in a blender. At least my body knows what they are. They can recognize them, all right? So inflammation inside the body puts 25 to 35 million Americans at risk for heart disease and stroke. It's far more dangerous than high cholesterol. High cholesterol is just a huge moneymaker, completely treatable with functional medicine, clinical nutrition, lifestyle changes, and altering your stress levels. Just like this one, overconsumption of processed flour and sugar. One bag of small french fries stays in our body 212 days. Well, why does it do that? Because your body, your cell, does not recognize what a hydrogenated oil is. It doesn't know what mazola is. Bob made that just 50 years ago. And by the way, oil should be in dark containers and it should be in a refrigerator. But what we do is we boil them to 550 degrees. We kill everything living inside of them. And then what we do is we have longer shelf life. But we should never be consuming foods like this because what happens inside that cell for 210 days? Frank, the guy inside the cell, goes, I don't know what this is. Let me stick it in the back of the cell. What happens when it sits in the back of the cell? It denatures DNA, it changes DNA. What is altered DNA eventually ca called? Cancer. Cancer. Yes, so this is why in 2000, I'm sorry, I forgot the date, New England Journal of Medicine, trans fats cause cancer, period. Trans fats cause cancer, period. Trans fats cause cancer. What is a trans fat? Margarine, hydrogenated corn oil, any, any oil made in a lab by Bob. Bob has made a lot of money and has caused a lot of chronic illness. So, foods to eliminate, the ones you already know. Foods to add, dark green leafy vegetables, some fruit, I like berries, easy with the fruit. Cold water fish, grass-fed protein, there's plenty of grass-fed protein. When I went to undergraduate school, I'd have to go to some weirdo place to buy grass-fed beef, right? It didn't exist, now you can buy it anywhere. Why would you eat conventional beef if you eat beef if it's right there grass-fed? Nuts and seeds, walnuts have the highest amount of omega-3 fatty acids, it's the most anti-inflammatory nut you could eat. And of course, water. Omega-3 fatty acids are wonderful. Just buy them from a reputable brand. Do not buy fish oil with omega-6s or 9s in them. Just buy pure omega-3 fatty acids. Do not take them if you're on blood thinners like Coumadin. Coumadin was invented in the 50s. 
Um, it's actually a byproduct of rat poison. It's warfarin. It's very dangerous. If you want to kill somebody, give them too much Coumadin. Okay, a lot of fun. Ginger, turmeric, boswellia. I love these as natural anti-inflammatories. These herbals work wonderful as natural daily and curcumin. Just great, great natural anti-inflammatories given to us by God. Avoid the use of the sale. Avoid low or non-fat diets. Fat's good for you, just the right type of fats. Get rid of high fructose corn syrup and hydrogenated oil. Chronic high stress has to be identified. Do something about it. Frequent use of refined shower stimulants and rapid weight loss is horrible. You want to commit to this. You want to don't fixate on your weight. You want to stay a bit hungry. You want to eat leaner and you want to do this for life. Shop, don't shop the interior of your grocery store. That's Bob other than your toilet paper. Avoid all that. Try to eat everything that food is meant to rot or spoil. Just eat it before it does. It's supposed to be cold. It's supposed to have color. White food stink. White flour, white sugar, white salt. Anything white has basically been manufactured, has been processed, try not to use it. These are simple suggestions. Second bullet point, many doctors and nutritionists spend too much time recommending supplements because that's where the money is. Too much time, too little time is spent on dietary modifications. Dietary modifications is complicated. Remember my slides on obesity? That's complicated. Did you see all that doctor stuff? It's not easy dissecting disorders or where they come from. And obesity, make no mistake about it, is a leading cause of premature death. In every study for cancer, heart disease, and any chronic illness, obesity is always a comorbid habit. Sensational six, those are my five kids. Aww. I know there's a, it says sensational six. If you knew Sophia, she counts for two. <laughs> What's my time like? All right. All right, five minutes. How am I going to do this? All right, let's keep going. <laughs> uh, since what kills, that's my son Ben, what kills most Americans today is chronic disease. Health literacy is the key to longevity. Guy does a sociological study, and it's in Japan. World-renowned violinist, somebody you'd spend hundreds of dollars for to see. Plays his heart out for 10 hours, he made $15. People are walking around blind, stoned, Drugged, stressed out, obese, chronically sick, and they're not even aware that somebody's playing the violin like that. Folks, we need to dial in as a miracle that this human brain is and dial in to be present. We need to be present in our supermarkets. We need to be present as we shop and as we think and as we pray and as we spend time with others. We need the presence of life again. And that's what this slide represents. Awareness is what that slide was all about. We need to be more aware of the violin player. Not you guys, the people on 537. We need to be more aware of the fact that apologetics, this is what the Lord led me to about seven years ago to start st studying pretty extensively. It's a religious discipline of defending religious doctrines through a systematic argumentation or discourse. Early Christian writers who defended their beliefs against critics and recommended their faith to outsiders were called Christian apologetics. I like to think of myself as I come out of the health portion of the conversation that the theology, the understanding is there a God is far more important than anything I could ever study or understand. So Darwin consumed all of our lives, not just me who studied science for a living. Darwin was the very principle, the philosophy we were all raised in. The Origin of the Species was published in 1859, and since that book was published, the next book that followed that book to have such a profound effect on human behavior, in my opinion, more on our youth, is this one I shared with you by Dawkins called The God Delusion. Now, this is where my conversation changes. Now we're going to spend time saying to ourselves, was Darwin right? How do we give a defense gently, calmly, as to how the awareness of why Darwin was not correct. We're either one of four things. Whenever I meet someone, this is me playing pastor. 
which I am not, I say to myself, all right, Lord, this person's either walking with the Lord, struggling, seeking, or has absolutely no interest. This is my audience. I don't care who's in the room. I don't pick. I want everybody, because ultimately, if I'm giving a defense of Jesus Christ, I want to do it in a loving, caring way, and I want to do it in a way that maybe stimulates thought that's a little different than anyone else. So I use 1 Peter 3.15. So why did I create what is my focus with by design? To allow God's design for our health to follow it. And it begins with love and truth. It doesn't begin with the scale and mirror. Love and truth. Number three, to ask, is there a God? Is there actually a creator? Or did we evolve, which is what my understanding was my entire life as I studied science? There was no God in science class, period. Is evolution real? Do you believe that a whole lot of time plus a whole lot of chance became a whole lot of matter? Because that's the God of atheism. The God of atheism was taken apart by an atheist mathematician who won the Nobel Prize. And what he set out to do in a mathematical equation was to prove what the mathematics would be like if we evolved. This mathematical equation that he came up with, which eventually drew him to become a believer in God, was, follow me, the same amount of chance that it takes for evolution to be true is the same mathematical equation for a tornado blowing into a junkyard and forming a fully formed functioning 747. I can't believe in a God of evolution because I can't believe in that chance. Many scientists believe in God and the Creator, but they can't say it because they'll lose their job, like this mathematician. So we have to say to ourselves, Mr. Darwin, Darwin was brilliant. He even said in his book, read this, stay with me. It if it could be demonstrated that any complex, remember that C word, complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would completely break down. He said it in his book. He said, take my book, throw it in the garbage can. Throw it in the garbage can if you could show me, as he's looking through a three lens microscope, He's looking at a cell. It had two or three things in it. That's what he had. But he was smart enough to say that if you ever show me a complexity of human life, throw my book away. What happened? Darwin knew the existence of the cell and even its larger components. He lacked the grasp of how complex these components were and how they had to work in unison in such complexity for cell even function to exist. Was he right? Chris, do I have time? Ah, uh, we really don't. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. He's on, very honest. So, what I was about to show you, you come see me, I'll show it to you. It's a three minute video on the complexity of the cell. God created all creatures to be able to thrive and thrive. This complex institution behavior begins with design. I will end with this. We start the year off, it's January. Husbands lay on the couch and they watch college football. Eat about 10,000 calories of Chinese food in February. We love each other, it's Valentine's Day. We eat candy. And then we roll into March, it's St. Patrick's Day. Now I'm gonna talk about the debauchery of St. Patrick's Day. Then we Easter, Easter, Bob made peeps. He gave us peeps for Easter, right Bob? <laughs> for his peeps. Then it's, then, then it's May, it's Memorial Day, right? We're gonna tell our soldiers, backyard barbecues, beer, pizza. Right? Hamburgers, hot dogs. Fourth of July rolls around. Beer, pizza, ham, beer. Labor Day, I worked hard all year. I need to go get drunk. I'm going to spend all weekend getting drunk. Right? This is what we do to our bodies. Then it's Halloween. We send our little ones out. It's October. We're going to feed them. They're bouncing off the wall. Give Johnny Ridlin. He's, he's Ridlin. He's ADD. AD, ADD. Uncle Bob comes over to ask for Thanksgiving. Downs 3,000 calories. Falls asleep on the couch. My aunt has the nerve to say, eat the tryptophan in the turkey. Tryptophan works on an empty stomach. Uncle Bob's in a diabetic coma. His body just shut him down. Now, now it's Christmas. Christmas is now four weeks long. Four weeks of parties, uh, drinking, food, people. 
Now, backyard barbecues, we go, this is the way we all go. And then when we die, we send each other fruit baskets. 